Hello, I'm Andre Rosier, and this is the Havoc Boxing Show. Welcome to the Havoc Boxing Show. My name is Andre Rosier, and we have a very special guest today. Someone that's very close to my heart, someone who I've seen rise up from the junior Olympic ranks to becoming a world champion. Today, I'd like to say hello to Louis Colazzo. How are you, Louis? I'm good, yourself? Not too bad, not too bad. Well, I usually start with asking my guests how they became affiliated with boxing. But we're going to go right to the heart of the matter. Louis' fantastic win at the Barclays Center against Victor Ortiz. Louis, tell us a little bit about leading up to that fight and the eventual fight itself. Well, um, going into the fight, uh, a lot of people counted me out, you know, the way they were um, publicizing the, the event. And uh, I just did what I normally do, just go work hard, train hard in the gym. And um, this was a, a big fight for me. Uh, I haven't fought in, in this altitude of a fight in quite some time, since 2009, since I fought Andre Berto. And um, I was already motivated, but the way they were making the fight look, like he was the superstar, like he was Goliath and I was little David, you know? <laughs> right. And um, this was escalated the motivation that I had, the, the drive that I, I, I wanted to become a world champion again. And uh, this is a, a step closer to what I want to be. Well, I know a lot of people didn't think that you were going to win the fight. It's not like they didn't say you had a chance, but they didn't think you were going to win the fight. As I was watching you prepare for the bout, I knew you were going to win the fight. My only question was how it was going to end. Would it be a decision or a knockout? And I was pleasantly surprised that it ended in the second round. Tell me, did you think that you were actually going to stop him that early? Well, uh, going into the, to the fight, we trained for the long haul. Uh, I knew I was going to get the W any way possible, and um, it caught me out of surprise too. You know, uh, going into the fight, I was looking at the tapes, and I noticed his hook is always wide. Right. He throw it wide. So my thing was, if we could throw hooks, I, my hook got to be short, crisp, and, and keep my left hand up because we throw the same shots. Right. And um, second round, it came, and... I saw her and I just threw it and night night. <laughs> night night. Well, now since you have defeated Victor Ortiz, what is in your future? What is in your immediate future uh, from this uh, fantastic victory? Well, uh, now just wait to see uh, what Golden Boy has in store for me. Uh, I want the big fights, you know, uh, Floyd, everybody wants Floyd. Whoever doesn't want Floyd, I guess they don't want a challenge. Uh, Madonna's hot right now. He just came off a good victory off of Broner. And um, Danny Garcia, he's moving up in, uh, to the World's Weight division after this fight here. And those are the type of fights that I want. I want to give the boxing fans what they want, Exc excitement. And uh, I believe I can do that. If you had your preference, if you could choose right now, who would be your next opponent? Like I said, I love challenges and I would love Floyd. You know, Floyd is the, the guy to beat. He got zero. He got zero losses, and uh, I would love to take that zero and turn it into a one. Okay. Now, with the dynamics of boxing as they are right now, and you know how difficult it is to actually get in the ring with a Floyd Mayweather, who would be your next choice? I'll go Danny Garcia. Um, Danny Garcia. You know, he's representing Philadelphia, Puerto Rican. I'm representing New York, Puerto Rican. It'd be a hell of a fight in uh, in New York City or wherever it takes place. Now, Louis. As you do know, 
I speak in the third sense because most of my guests happen to be my athletes. But I'm just talking to you as the host of this show. You have had some fantastic moments in the ring. But unfortunately, you haven't always received the decision that you should have. What do you feel, in your opinion, is the reason that you don't get those close ones or ones that you definitely won without a doubt? Um, well, in boxing, there's a lot of politics in it. Mm -hmm. But I believe uh, if I would have won those fights, I would have never gave all glory to God. So I was really basically thinking about my time. It wasn't God's time. And what's going on now is on God's time. I matured. Um, I'm living life differently, more spiritually. And um, I'm just grateful for every everything I experienced back then. Because now I got the, it made the character that I am now, and, and I got a lot of wisdom out of it. So now I'm just blessed with this opportunity, and I uh, thank God for it. Now, let's, uh, let's talk about that a little bit. You, you said you, are, you have found your place in, in your spirituality. What, what led you to your awakening, uh, your, your embracing of the Most High? You know, um, having everything, I guess, you know, having money and everything that I guess a human would want, I had, and I still wasn't happy with, with what I had. And I, I, was, I was missing something deep inside, and I didn't know what it was. And to a point, that I was just partying, drinking, and just not living a, a right life and taking what God gave me for granted. And um, one day, I just asked him, God, please give me a sign. Is it, um, if you could take me out this darkness, I'll turn my life over to you. The next day, I swear, like, I was just a totally different person. I just woke up with a different attitude, and just, I just wanted to be around everyone. And since then, I just... Just following God. Now, do you feel that that has helped you in your boxing career? Absolutely. Ha okay. Could you tell me why? Because, you know, now I take things for what it is. I don't take it for granted. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm just living, just living day by day, just not just living for material things. I'm living for the spirit, not for the flesh. And when you live for the flesh, I notice you start doing a lot of things you shouldn't be doing. And um, I'm just grateful for everything. I'm just so excited and happy just to be praising God the way I am. That is very, very, very important. What we need now is for athletes to understand that they shouldn't take anything for granted because the scope of time that you have to work with as a world champion is very fleeting. Not to be at your peak working beyond that point. And I'm so happy that I have been able to see you rise to that occasion. I appreciate it. And um, for anybody watching, like, you can have everything in the world. But I, I, I've been noticing, too, with a lot of uh, actors and stuff, they look for happiness in the wrong places. And they turn to look for the things in the wrong places, but they're never happy. They have everything in the world, but they're missing that one thing. And I think if they seek the higher man upstairs, the creator, they'll, they'll definitely that little piece they're missing is gonna fill them, fill them up with joy. Growing up, it was it was rough for me because my parents were going through a divorce when I was young, and I, I really didn't know too much about it until maybe three years ago. I was still young, I was still a little kid, and uh, he was he turned into to to alcohol. He wasn't happy. They went through a divorce, and um, when I was nine years old, I, I had no positive outlet, and. Uh, my older brother was like the only positive role model for me, but he was not really positive. He was doing negative stuff, selling drugs. And I picked up on that at an early age. And uh, before I started boxing, I started selling drugs at age nine years old and smoking marijuana at 10. And um, my father stood drinking for a couple of years. Then he met my stepmom. And then my stepmom changed him. So then he turned himself to me and took me to the boxing gym. And when what was, gym was that? Star Wars City Boxing Club. That was a long time ago, huh? Absolutely, yeah. I was about 10, 11 years old. Mm -hmm. I remember the first day you entered the gym, and uh, we had a team. What was the name of your 
early boxing team? What were you guys called? Untouchables. <laughs> and why were you called the Untouchables? Because, you know, we, we would go to tournaments and we would just take care of business. <laughs> you guys were a winning team. Absolutely. So during that time, when did you feel as you were progressing as an athlete that you might be a professional fighter and maybe even a world champion? What, what stage of your development did that occur? You know, um, well, it took, even, I didn't even think about the pros. I was thinking more for the Golden Gloves because having so many little uh, J.O. fights and going into the open class. I think the silver gloves, when we went to uh, Kansas City, that was right. like the king of the crop for me. Me fighting in one ring, and then you had uh, Ricardo Williams in the other ring. And everybody was going crazy, going back and forth to see, you know, to see both fights. Right. And I think that was like the, the point to me, like, oh, I could do something with this. Okay, very good. Now, let's talk about your formula years when you became a open class fighter when you started boxing on the national stage. Did, at that point in time, your mind start melding into, hey, you know what, maybe one day I could be a world champion? Yeah. Um, winning the Golden Gloves in 98 gave me a little itch, like, I, I think I could do something in the pros. And then uh, t in 2000, I fought uh, Yuri Foreman. You know, he's a former world champion now. Right. And um, I'm like, he was a big guy coming out of Europe coming to the States and to New York, he was a favorite too, going in. I yes, was always the underdog. Right. <laughs> and um, he was a favorite, and the way I, I, I boxed him, I mean, I could do something, man, because it, I'm disciplined to the sport. I, I love the sport. I got the passion for it. And um, when I went to the Olympic box offs in Tampa and fighting these elite fighters that have been world-class, like, fighters, you know, in the amateurs, and um, I'm like, I could do something, and... I just went for it and former world champion. Wow, isn't that something? It's amazing. Now, when you became a professional, your first bout was in uh, Young the Yonkers Raceway. Yes. And uh, you didn't have a headgear on now. You didn't have a shirt on. The gloves were smaller. What was your first idea? What was your first emotion when you entered that ring in an entirely different format now. What was that feeling that you were experiencing at that time? Uh, it was insane, you know, uh, I felt half naked. <laughs> Usually I have, a, you know, headgear, some, right. some clothes on. But um, them little gloves, man, to actually get hit with them little eight ounce gloves, it was just totally different. I'm like, oh man, what did I put myself into? <laughs> but, um, you know, just the love of it, I, I, I fell in love with it even more. Just and then see the people going crazy it just it's a rush to me like to give to be able to give back to those fans that love the sport oh very good very good now you were on a early tear in your career and then you had one roadblock tell me about that really quick well um the, i believe that's the edwin casitas fight from uh he was from uh if i'm not mistaken from colombia uh, he was tough. It was one of my step-up fights. It was the, the second episode on show on Showbox, and um, I don't know. I just got caught with a good shot in the back of my head. I thought it was a premature stoppage, mm -hmm. but um, the referee thought I was hurt, so he stopped the fight. And you know, we, after that fight, we tried to get a rematch. He didn't want it, so I just had to move on and don't dwell on it. With that said. We will return with Louis Colazzo to the Havoc Boxing Show. We're back with the Havoc Boxing Show with my special guest, Louis Colazzo. Now, Louis, you have been one of the most underrated and most exceptional athletes in the welterweight division for a long time. Now, that almost sounds like an oxymoron. How can you be underrated and exceptional at the same time? But the reason why I say that is that you just don't seem to get the dues that you deserve. Now, you're shining once again. Uh, there have been some bouts, like I said earlier, that you just didn't, didn't get the nod on. You didn't get the credit for. At this point in time, what do you have to do to make sure that this never happens again? Um... Keep performing like I did the other night versus Victor Ortiz. I like that. <laughs> uh, 
don't leave it to the judges. I like that also. <laughs> <laughs> judges are no good. <laughs> Absolutely. I, I, I've learned. But um, you know, like I said, I just got to keep going out there. And the fight goes two rounds, it goes two rounds, it goes one, it goes one. But don't leave it to the judges. I got to mm. like, win in dramatic fashion. Dramatic fashion is the way it must go. Now, we were speaking about who might be next. In the business of boxing, who do you think is going to be your next opponent? To be honest, I hope it's either Madonna or Danny Garcia. I know he's moving up in weight. I could be his first test if they want to like test the waters. I'm more than welcome to test the waters with. Uh, I know I'm going to be underrated again. Um, the underdog, I'm all with it. Now, do you think there might be another welterweight that they might choose as an opponent for you in the near future? Um, not sure. Mm -hmm. You know, um, I'm just going to wait and see, just stay in the gym, keep doing what I'd love to do. Right. And uh, just wait and see, just hopefully it's something big. Right. I think at this point in time, you might have put a scare and a lot of doubt in some of these welterweights with that performance. Well, uh, you know, in this business, you can't be scared. And you can't be scared to get hit as well. Right. Um, there's no crying in boxing. And uh, you want to be the best, you got to fight the best. And uh, I feel like I'm one of the best, one of the top guys in the welterweight division. I just proved it. Um, going into this fight, Floyd beat Victor Ortiz with a sucker punch. Right. Um, that's why he, he got stopped. That was one of his losses. And then Josecito broke his jaw. That was another stoppage. That happened in uh, the Madonna fight. He quit. But my fight was a knockout. So none of these top guys did that, what I did, right. in two rounds on top of that. And um, they got to, they got, y'all better watch out. One of your statements after the fight was, a lot of people don't think I can punch. Well, basically, look at me now. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, that cracked me up. I mean, I thought that since I do know, that you are the athlete you are. I've seen you from the very beginning. I know you do have punching power. And you have what I call that sharp punching power. The power that you don't see, which is the dangerous power, because now I can't do anything about it. A lot of people tend to underestimate boxers of your nature with that ability. And that's what gets them in trouble. We're going to make sure that you continue to keep them off balance so that they end up in trouble. Now, let's talk a little bit about your, your boxing style because it's unlike anything I've ever seen before. Tell me a little bit about how you dictate policy in the ring. You know, I just go in there, it feel like I'm dancing. You know, when I first started, I had no rhythm whatsoever. You know that. <laughs> You had to put music on for me to start <laughs> dancing a little bit. But um, as I kept going, and um, in the amateurs, that's what I, I did a lot, was move and throw combinations. And I just try to keep working, keep working, and try to master, master um, the, my boxing abilities and the, the gifted talent that God gave me with these legs, the little chicken legs that I have. <laughs> and um, I just put it to work, and thank God every, I'm still feeling young, feeling good, and um, I'm excited for the next one. I am too, Louie. Before we go, tell me about your tattoos really quick. Oh, man, this is an addiction, addiction that I had since I was about 15 years old, 14. And um, I'm done, though. That's it. I'm done. No more tattoos. Do you me. have any more room on your body for me? <laughs> I have some, some space left, but that's it. No mas. <laughs> no mas. <laughs> well, I want to thank you, Louis, the people's champion. My nickname is... Baby Lulu, because he's my <laughs> sobrino. Colazo, thank you for joining us at the Havoc Boxing Show. And remember, we are in the hurt business. Future world champion, Louis Colazo, thanks for joining us. Ortiz practically leaps across the ring. Ortiz told us yesterday in the fighter meetings he would look to box. His body language says he's coming forward, but 
He's telling us he's not going to be as aggressive. He's going to look to box. So let's see how he comes out early on in the fight. Comes out with a high guard, Ortiz. And he comes out seeming to be all business. Left hand of the body to start things by Ortiz. Here's the thing. Victor also must be chomping at the bit. Yeah, for four to 18 months. Victor just shoots his head in there. Three punch combination. Victor seemed to be a little bit tight, but better change. Right hand by Ortiz. Yeah, he's, he's looking to land a big shot early. He should look to really loosen up and try to set it up. Colazzo looks a bit more loose as he's trying to now cut the ring down on Ortiz and make it uncomfortable. Two southpaws, Polly Yeah, well, two out of the three fights tonight have been a double southpaw. These guys both experienced, both have been around the track, both have seen just about all there is to see. Yeah, both guys have been in with some of the best in the world. And have shown themselves to be among the best in the world as yep. well. Victor trying to change the look, trying to get into a little bit of a rhythm now. Colazzo has a pretty good left hand there. So that Colazzo is more in sharpshooting mode. Ortiz is more in I want to land a big punch mode. Colazzo is bringing the jab up from the floor, as we say. He gives you a really odd angle, though. He's definitely not squared up in front. Step back. Step back, step back. Step back. Nice. See the oh, short right hook. Has to break the between the clinch. The short right hook. Those, those are legal shots. You know, the referee will tell you when to break it, tell you to keep punching. Yeah, and he was saying step back, but he wasn't breaking them. And a lot of times, more work is going to happen there. Ortiz, the pursuer in this first round. A little two edges, though. It's, it's, a been mixed two edges. it's a bit mixed. It's been mixed as here Colazzo cuts the ring off again. It's both guys pursuing at, in times and both guys boxing at times. Seems like Ortiz is looking for the bigger shots, though. Colazzo seems more in sharpshooter mode, like I said earlier. Both trying to do some body work early in this fight. Good combinations by Ortiz. Three punch combination right on the button. That one was off. Both guys trying to work the body a lot early on. I think they both see that it's hard to land the head shot as both guys are sharp defensively. So I'm trying to target the body a little bit. So coming to the end of the first round, very close round. To, I mean, back well, and forth action. I thought Ortiz was a little busier. I gave it to him. Malazzo landed a good sh uh, sh check right hook there, but it seemed to wake up Ortiz, and Ortiz tried to get busy right after that. You know, Carazzo is holding his own. I mean, he's trying to establish, you know, like, I'm not going nowhere. I'm, I mean, come what you want to come with, but I'm not going anywhere. Both guys, both guys are, like I said, world-class fighters, and both guys are capable against each, each other. There's a little headbutt. In close quarters. Yeah, neither guy afraid to mix it up in there physically as well. Ortiz got warned earlier about using his head or, you know, getting his head in the way of a... And again, both guys targeting the body. Yep. Keep him up, keep him up. Oh, good left hand there by uh, Ortiz. Three punch combination. The Brazo just took a good right hand. And he just gave his left hand. Yep. Anything you can do, I can do better, right? 
Well, tonight's CompuBox stats brought to you by ThrowdownFantasy.com. Draft fighters, track stats, and win. And on the first round, Ortiz a little busier. They both threw the same amount of punches. Good jab by Colazzo. This is where now you try to start to see who's going to start to take advantage of the pace of the fight. You know, Ortiz come off a broken jaw, as we know, and he just took a good right hand. I wonder what the effect as rounds go on, whether he still had that in his mind or... Oh, good left hand. And good uppercut. Two good shots from Colazzo. Colazzo getting sharper. Or, you know, Ortiz convinced us that he doesn't mind. He's not thinking about his jaw. He had some hard sparring, and his, his jaw is not a problem. It's not even in his mind. But, of course, when you're getting hit with eight-ounce gloves, things can change. With no hair game. There. With no hair game. So, exactly. I, mean, I like to pay attention to it as the round go on, but both of these guys are, are at least... Colazzo is hitting with sharper punches on the button. Yeah, this yeah. has been a very good round for Colazzo. Seems like Colazzo's offense is just a little neater. Seems like Victor's almost uh, too much in a rush. If he can just slow down a half step and just kind of set himself up, he's, he's almost too much in a rush, sometimes smothering himself, sometimes coming in off balance. Even when he's landing, he's not maximizing his offense. Colazzo's got the better balance, so when he lands, it's, it's, more, uh, it's more visible. Yeah, double jab in the left hand two times in a row by Colazzo. See, it's almost like he's too anxious, Victor. He's, instead of setting it up, he's almost too anxious to land the big shot. Right hand on the left hand behind it by Ortiz. Right hand by Ortiz, and a pretty good shot. And a left hand behind it. How about the belt? Second or two left in that round. And it was a big right hook. He never saw it coming. I told people before, Colazzo is very live. This is a world-class fighter. People forgot about him, not because of his mishaps in the ring, but just because they haven't seen him. He's always been on a world-class level. Two, 259. And it was all about business tonight. Took care of it in the second round. One second left in the round when he dropped it. Two five nine, not five. And here, you know, things started to open up in this second round. Ortiz went for a big left hand, and then he kind of opened himself up for that right hook. The left hand was too wide. From a southpaw stance, you're supposed to throw that left hand straight. Even if you throw it wide, you don't want to throw it that wide. Came with a too wide of a left hand, and Colazzo kind of blocked it and came back with his own right hook. Textbook box.